Um, so you are working, and then there's a product side too, right? So yeah. you, you are giving them a product. What kinds of products? So we have never actually created a product for someone else, specifically, like as part of client service kind of thing. The products that we've created have been um, typically kind of open source. So one we have is called Story Pilot, which you can go, you can look at online. It's called it's storypilot.org. So it's this giant repository of documentary films, and we collect various metrics on all of the films, and um, looking at kind of the and yeah, like looking at the different kinds of impact that the films have had. And so if you're a media maker and you want to have a specific kind of impact, you can look in Story Pilot and kind of model yourself after some of these different films that have had a similar impact, or you can get a sense of what the landscape is that your film is going to be released to. So if you're making a film about cancer, you can see, you know, what are films about cancer that have come out in the last eight years or so, that sort of thing. So that, that's an example of a product that we build. Um, I was wondering if you would feel comfortable sharing, I know how you were saying earlier that like you really felt like you hit your stride in interviews when you were able to deliver that elevator pitch of like, I'm doing this because I see myself here in the future. Yeah. Is that something that you could model for us, like what that sounds like? If I can remember, you know how when you do something really well you just black out? After? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I can remember. Um, this was my question as well. Ooh. It's, it's, ooh. It can be an important one. Look at, I can um, look at my notes. Um, so I think it was really talking about how, I mean, a, a, a big part of it was talking about the importance of bringing research into the public sphere. Um, and how I had done that in the past and wanted to continue that in the future because that was such a big part of what Harvey Institute was doing at the time. And then being able to give specific examples. Um, also kind of drawing parallels between the study of language and society and the study of media and society and how really the three things are all connected, language, media, society. Um, that was part of it. Um, and. And I think also talking about the importance of social impact and really talking about some of the work that we did um, with African American English and with the blog and, um, and that sort of thing. I might remember other stuff as we, as we continue. But I can also definitely look it up and email you. Yeah. I know. It's follow up on Shannon's question a little bit as well. I've had this on my mind because I, I work with students who are like starting to craft that narrative. Mm. And oftentimes what I encounter um, in the, the stories that people tell me uh, is that it is really difficult to reset your frame of mind about yourself uh -huh. from student to like uh -huh. professional. Uh -huh. To really like believe and be able to elucidate what are your actual um, bona fides that you have yeah. But if you've always thought about your work as being curricular, um, right. your deliverables as being curricular, it can be difficult to like really parse out what it was that you did when you were doing linguistics. Yeah. So I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, I struggle a lot with that. Um, so whenever I would write cover letters, I would always lead with my research. Because that's who I was. You know, that's who we are. It's actually not who we are. <laughs> um, not everybody cares about that. And so when I was getting feedback and this is how I dealt with it. I got feedback from people who were not in academia, and they read my cover letters, and they were like, why are you talking about Spanish Harlem? And this has nothing to do with the job. And it was like, you have to let go of that part of yourself, and remember that it's always going to be a part of you. Your research is important, and it's, it doesn't go away. You still did it. Um, but for you know a job in tech, that may not be the most important thing. And yeah, I don't even think my coworkers actually really know what I did my research on. Um, but um, getting back to your question, so yeah, that, that challenge of kind of positioning yourself. It's really, really hard, but it's like instead of starting from a place of here's who I am and here's why I fit into your job, start with the job and work backwards. <laughs> And you know you all have an analytical skill set, analytical minds, and you can 
you know, look at the job and look at the job description and they're telling you exactly what they want, make a list right beside it of all the things that you have that fit those things and like work backwards instead of starting from this is who I am and this is my research. Um, this is a kind of specific question. Do you have any tips for sending cold emails to people? So people that you would like to maybe talk to or meet with, mm -hmm. not necessarily that there's a job opening, but just somebody you feel like you should know, but you don't know them. And right. But maybe even you have a personal email. not a specific case. Yeah. Maybe even you have a personal email address for them, but just what would you say and how would you market it? Because I feel like I'm yeah, you know what's funny? I've never sent a cold email. <laughs> hey, can I just piggyback? Because I was going to ask something yeah. similar from the other end, which is having received emails that are like, hi, I'm interested in what you do. Can I just pick your brain for a while? I always think, no. Right. Like, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <funny. Exactly. laughs> I probably shouldn't do that. Right? So, like, so, so like, how do you do that? How do you do, how do, you do that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, ideally, you want to find that, like, degree of separation, that person that connects you to do an introduction. At all costs, try to find someone because aren't you so much more likely to respond to a student if they're like, if if they worked with one of your colleagues or one of your colleagues recommended that they contact mm -hmm. you? Um, that's number one. In the case where it's not possible, oof. How have I never done this? Just to interject, this is where LinkedIn can be really powerful, even yeah. if you think you are not a quote LinkedIn person. LinkedIn's best functionality is your mutual connections with somebody. Right, and I didn't, I I mean, I like hate LinkedIn, I won't hate LinkedIn, maybe not you, but, um, <laughs> but, but I learned as I was on the job market, you don't exist unless you have a LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have a LinkedIn, yeah. and you know, make sure it's decent. Um, but yeah, so, uh, what I was gonna say, if you don't have a connection to someone, Try to find somebody who you think might be a connection. Like, try to like work your network, find someone in the similar field. Do you know this person as much as you possibly can? And then, if not, I guess I don't know. What would it, what would I be likely to respond to if they actually like if somebody sent me an email and it was clear that they were familiar with what I do and had read about me and not were not just sending me a form email that mm -hmm. they send everybody. I'm a lot more likely to respond. Mm -hmm. You can also frame it just straight up as an informational interview request, because the informational interview, you know, it's a very well-known genre to professional people. And so if it's very clear sort of what it is that you're asking for, not just can I pick your brain for my own benefit, um, that might be something that appeals to, to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if the, I mean, if there's anything you can offer them, if, some, if you can think of something, I'm sure that would go that would help, but I don't know. But yeah, yeah good luck with that. <laughs> so what are the background of, the, of your colleagues in Harmony Institute and like how you feel like working with them since people are from different backgrounds and do you have to explain a lot of linguistic stuff to them? Yeah, so the backgrounds are really diverse. Um, we have people from psychology, economics, um, more kind of oh, art history, literature. Um, we have a number of design people who come who come from design school. Um, we have software engineers, data engineers, um, people from the environmental sciences. And so I think because we all kind of come from different backgrounds, we're all really interested and open to hearing about each other's backgrounds, and we're all really kind of, we all have our own ways of explaining our, our own stuff. So it's not super challenging in that sense, um, because everybody's so open, and it's like you come there expecting to be part of a multidisciplinary team. Um, uh, yeah, as far as explaining linguistics, um, it's only really if I'm trying to defend a way of doing something. So the way that we're doing this um, bipolar study, uh, I think really, really reflects the kind of quantitative linguistics that I did. And so a lot of times I've kind of had to defend this, this, these techniques that I'm just used to taking for granted that, you know, that's how I do things. Um, oh, I was just remembering another example too. Um, 
Yeah, another thing is also getting people to kind of trust that I have expertise in language. So tech people love sentiment analysis, like love it. I hate sentiment analysis because I'm like, no, language is so nuanced. You cannot gather like sentiment that easily. Um, and so it drives me crazy whenever they're like, well, let's just do a sentiment analysis. And I'm like, no, let's do something better. Um, and so, you know, I have to really kind of break down the reasons why, why I don't think sentiment analysis is great. And, um, and, and, you know, trust me, I know about language. That's kind of, that can be challenging. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kind of differences in expectations for a humanities fellowship than maybe one of the like kind of National Science Foundation type ones that we usually find in linguistics? Um, do they kind of expect you to have a different sort of end product or experience? Or? Yeah, I mean, when I'm, when I'm doing humanities stuff or applying for humanities fellowships, I'm always downplaying the quantitative aspects of things. Um, for sure, that's not something they're super interested in, and really kind of highlighting the big insights about culture, humanity, the world, us, you know, people. Um, it's really a lot more about that and, and the way that you, the way that your narrative goes, um, you have to really be able to explain things in terms of their relationship to the world. Um, that would be the biggest difference, I think. But otherwise, you know, the Humanities Fellowships I've applied for have really been just very accepting of linguistics and, and the fact that I'm a linguist. And even actually this, the ACLS Public Fellows Program this year, there's three linguists that got it. Or not this year, the year that I got it, which was actually last year. Um, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if at least one or two linguists got it this year. Um, so they're very, very friendly to linguists. So I recommend applying for this fellowship. Questions about anything else? Any other questions? I have one final one. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for the uh, folks here who are going to be graduating with a master's degree mm -hmm. in linguistics mm -hmm. rather than a PhD? And linguistics. I mean, you're probably better off. <laughs> 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 um, and I tell people this all the time because uh, the world kind of doesn't know what to do with PhDs, to be honest. Um, the the world, the the non-academic world. So we have to work so much harder to kind of explain where we fit in 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 uh, in you know, not a nonprofit job or a government job or private sector. Um, so whenever people tell me they want to do a PhD, I'm like, okay, why do you want to do a PhD? Do you want to do a PhD because you really want to spend like 10 years learning about something you love? If yes, then do it. That's why I did it and I loved it. It was great. Um, but if you're doing a PhD because you want to get a job after that's not a professor job, don't do that. It's so much better to get out there in the world and start getting experience right away um, because, yeah, the PhD isn't going to give you a huge advantage in, in the non-academic world. Um, the master's degree, you know, you've shown that you're getting a little bit more expertise in a specific area. Um, you might have a little bit more maturity than somebody coming out as an undergrad. Um, but you haven't really lost like seven years of your life working on this PhD, um, which, you know, P don't worry, like PhDs, you'll get the jobs too, but there's no it's like specific advantage to getting a PhD and then going out uh, into the non-academic working world, in my opinion, and my experience. Maybe we can just finish up with one um, practical thing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned several things that you had applied for, so you have a lot of experience dealing with and deciphering job ads, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Any, any like final practical tips about job ads, when to freak out, when not to freak out? Maybe educational requirements? <laughs> um, yeah, because I feel like we run into that, those of us who 
just masters will see things that say like that they want someone with a PhD. I've never it's seen not that. really a job that you really need a PhD mm -hmm. for. That's just even the distinction between like okay, you have a master's of one year of experience versus bachelor's right. with like three to five years of experience. Mm -hmm. Like when when do you know if you can stretch or fit yeah. into that category? Um so I'd say Okay, in my experience, it was very, very rare to see a job that was PhD only. Um, so if it happens, they might really be looking for a PhD, they might not. Um, I always applied for stuff, even if I didn't meet all of the qualifications. And um, I think in a lot of cases, you know, organizations, if they love you, are not going to care. Um, or they won't waste your time, they just won't contact you. So I think there's nothing wrong with applying um, if you don't have the exact educational requirements. Um, but yeah, that I'm I would I'm curious to know like what kind of jobs like would only want a PhD. I can think of a couple, but again, like they seem really rare to me. Mm -hmm. I've seen like government stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. sometimes it's it's we get more down down the kind of job I've never applied for. <laughs> it could be like the difference between they might have the same posting at a GS twelve level instead of a GS fourteen yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, government is really complicated. Do you have someone coming in who's talking about government? Uh. Yes, oh, we're working on that. We're working yeah. on a whole panel of government folks, actually. Okay, good. Because yeah. my understanding, well, first of all, I know I'm not qualified to answer the question, <laughs> um, but there are a ton of public fellows who are working in government, mm -hmm. and it is so incredibly complicated. The application process, and it's like, you know, you, you have to start at a certain level, and then you get promoted to another level, and you can't just kind of go in at any level. So I would hold that question for mm -hmm. government people, mm -hmm. I think. Um, Maybe the the main point here is like, don't get too hung up on educational requirements. Yeah, or any it requirements. Is, you know, the the higher education you have, the more added value you are, and you're not in the heads of the folks who are hiring. They might list something as you know, bachelor's in three years or master's in one year. What they're looking for is master's in one year, or what they're looking for is just master's. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as deciphering job ads, um, I'm definitely the type of person that I get very overwhelmed by job ads, especially when they're really long and there's a lot of information and they have a lot of information about the, the organization and that sort of thing. And um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but this is an actual technique and maybe you guys will talk about this at some point, that, but I've read about it in self-help books, which is the T-chart. And on one side you list all the things that that job is looking for on the other side, all the ways that you fit those things that job is looking for. And it just clarifies things so much. It makes it so much easier to write your cover letter because you can just hit on all those points. And that's, that's that connecting the dots stuff that they love. Because then, you know, you know then, then they don't have to do the work. And it's not because they don't want to do the work, it's because they have all these applicants and are trying to go through them very quickly. So you want to make the reader do as little work as possible. Okay, we have time for one more question. And also, like, uh, since you're working now, like, back then when you looked for a job, did you use LinkedIn or you used, you started your LinkedIn after? No, I did it while I was looking for a job. Mm -hmm. um, because I realized, and, I, and, I, and even more so now, I realize now that I see the hiring process from the other side, um, because I've been involved on some hiring committees at my job. Um, the first thing people do when they get, <laughs> like, when they're going to interview someone is they look at you on LinkedIn. They want to see your face. They want to see a snapshot of what you've done. So I knew that I had to create, I, so yeah, I begrudgingly created a LinkedIn. Um, and, <laughs> and so basically, you know, it's just putting your picture. Um, I think I cut and pasted stuff from my resume just to start, just to have something, like some kind of placeholder. And then I've kind of made it a little bit better over the years. Um, I never used it for networking, but I've heard it's very good for that, as and we talked about that today. Um, and yeah, mostly it was just, I used it as an identifier, like this is who I am, here's an easy way to find me, and here's an easy way to find out about my work and experience. And I'm showing you that I have nothing to hide because it's all on the internet. You know, no one's gonna lie about, well no, people probably do. But um, it is unlikely that you will lie about a job if you're putting it on your LinkedIn page. It probably means you really did that job and people like to see that kind of thing. 
But do you care if uh, the person, the candidate, like, um, like if they have a coherent line of like their career change, or mm -hmm. if you, or if you see like there's jumps in industry or interest, is there going to be a factor when you? Not not with LinkedIn, at least not in my experience. Um, typically, people do have all kinds of weird stuff. You know, weird jumps and transitions, and it's not clear from LinkedIn. But then that's when you get the person in, and they connect all those dots for you and explain everything and kind of verbally, or even in the cover letter, are able to connect that for you. Um, but there's always all kinds of stuff, weird stuff, on people's LinkedIn and even on people's resumes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.